I'm Norman Wahlberger. In this video I want to introduce you to the idea that relativistic geometry actually has a prior existence in the realm of Euclidean planar geometry. This might be a little bit surprising. And in fact, it opens the possibility that relativistic geometry could have been discovered uh, many centuries uh, ago. Okay, so what we're going to do though is work in one higher dimension. Instead of in two-dimensional relativistic geometry, in three-dimensional relativistic geometry. And when we go from two dimensions to three dimensions in relativistic geometry, it's a little bit more subtle, a little bit more interesting than going from two dimensions to three dimensions in Euclidean geometry. So the difference between a circle and a sphere in ordinary geometry is not quite as much as the difference between a hyperbola and these hyperboloids of revolution that are going to appear in this uh, three-dimensional setting. So our start is uh, three-dimensional relativistic geometry and we're going to set it up by introducing a red or relativistic dot product. Okay, and it's probably what you would expect. Uh, the, the dot product of this vector with this vector is x1, x2 plus y1, y2 minus z1, z2. So we get that crucial minus sign that separates this dot product from the Euclidean dot product that we've already talked about. Okay, so the natural things that we've now almost second nature for us to do is first of all to define the quadrants of a vector in three-dimensional space, just v dot v, and in coordinates it's x squared plus y squared minus z squared. That's sort of the fundamental quadratic form that, uh, that exists in our space. And the notion of perpendicularity, that two vectors are perpendicular precisely when their dot product, in this sense, is zero. And uh, we have this interesting notion of now a null vector, that a vector v whose dot product with itself is zero, in other words, when x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals zero, this is called a null vector. Okay, so this is just the basic setup of three-dimensional relativistic geometry. And this is a kind of a, a relativity theory, which is not quite as elementary as the two-dimensional uh, relativity theory in XY plane, which you might call baby relativity, but not quite at the level of the Minkowski-Einstein relativity in three plus one or four dimensions. So it's kind of a, like a teenage uh, relativity, but we're going to see that it's uh, very... Uh, interesting and once we understand it it's not much of a step to go up to the adult relativity of three plus one uh, dimensional space in other words in four dimensional space time let's have a look at the spheres in this geometry so those are given by equations v dot v equals k for some fixed k and we'll have three standard spheres to look at first of all s zero the sphere when the k equals zero x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals zero, that defines a cone in three-dimensional space. So here is our x, y, z three-dimensional space with x-axis in this direction, y-axis here, z-axis here. And in red here, right there, you see this cone. All right, And that's the cone that's defined by this equation, x squared plus y squared minus z squared. So that's the analog in three dimensions of this pair of null lines that we had in the two-dimensional relativistic setting. And you can think about this cone perhaps as being what you get when you take a pair of lines like this and just rotate it around the z-axis. Imagine the z-axis going straight up. Okay. If we just rotate that around like that, keeping the origin fixed, uh, then we sweep out this cone. Okay, another way of thinking about it is like this. That's what the cone is. Okay, physicists call this the light cone. Of course, it plays a very important role in relativistic geometry because it corresponds to the trajectories or world lines of photons. But I remind you that we don't need to know any physics uh, currently. Okay, then there are these two interesting sort of analogs of the unit sphere. And in this relativistic setting, there are, just as there were in the two-dimensional case, there are uh, spheres corresponding to k equals 1 and k equals minus 1. In the two-dimensional setting, they were both rectangular hyperbolas, just facing in different directions. Here, they're different. 
This is a, a major difference between the uh, three-dimensional case and the two-dimensional case. So let's have a look at this S1 first. X squared plus Y squared minus Z squared equals 1. And it's a very interesting quadratic surface called a quadric in geometry. And it's in fact geometrically a hyperboloid of one sheet. If we looked at it in ordinary Euclidean geometry, that's what we would say. And here it is right here. It's this hyperboloid. It's got a circular cross section here. And then it uh, comes out or down on the waist and comes back out like this. Uh, the uh, center point tower in downtown Sydney is a, is a kind of a hyperboloid of one sheet like this, but rather uh, sort of more narrower, rather not, not so wide. In fact, it's a very popular kind of construction for architects because it turns out to be a ruled surface. So if you imagine this as being the uh, equatorial circle, and uh, then it turns out that you can describe this uh, surface by imagining two lines like this, which are just the same kinds of lines that generated the cone, but now instead of being at the origin, they're um, you know, attached to the, this unit sphere at some point. And then just imagine moving them around, and letting them sweep around. The surface that they're going to cut out in three-dimensional space is actually this nice smooth hyperboloid of one sheet. And this makes it clear that there, this is a ruled surface because it has all these lines in it, namely the lines at any given point, if you freeze the camera, you have two pairs of lines that are in the surface. Okay, and then on top of that we have the sphere S minus 1 given by the equation x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals minus 1. That's what in Euclidean geometry we would call a hyperboloid of two sheets. It's what we get when we take this hyperbola that we had a look at last time and revolve it around the z-axis. This first hyperboloid was also what you get, but this time when you revolve this hyperbola around the z-axis. Now when we rotate this hyperbola around the z-axis, we get these two sort of cup-like shapes. Uh, one opening up in this direction, inside the light cone, another opening downwards uh, inside the light cone in that negative direction. So this one has two separate components, while this hyperboloid of one sheet is quite different. So this is a very interesting geometry that's studied in many different contexts. And so we're seeing that one way of thinking about it in this framework that we're talking about is just a picture of various spheres in this relativistic three-dimensional geometry. All right, now let's put that relativistic geometry aside for the time being. We're going to return to it at the end of the lecture. But now I want to start to introduce you to a very classical subject in Euclidean planar geometry. All right, so you can forget about relativistic geometry for the next half an hour. We're going to just talk about planar circle geometry. Very classical stuff going back to the 19th century and earlier. So this is now a picture of the Euclidean plane. Just the ordinary Euclidean uh, structure, which we like to think of as being basically captured by the, the quadrants. That x squared plus y squared basic quadratic form. And here are two circles. All right, um, let's call them C1 and C2. And this diagram shows two auxiliary points which are associated to this pair of circles, namely O and O prime. So what are these points? Well, they're what we get when we look at common tangent lines to the two circles. So here is a line which is tangent to both circles at the same time. And here's another such. And these two uh, lines meet at this point O. And that's called a center of similitude. And in other places, it's called a homothetic center of the two circles. It has the property that if we look at the two circles from this point here, they are directly in line. In other words, if we dilate the space, centered at this point O, 
In other words, just perform a dilation where everything, say, grows or contracts by the same fixed amount. Then we can send this circle to this circle. Okay? You can just dilate everything and this will expand to over there. That's why it's sometimes called a center of similitude because that's a similarity transformation, uh, that dilation. There's another such center of similitude by taking the other kinds of tangents. These ones right here. And uh, we could call that O prime. Now, how do we actually construct, if you had two circles like uh, this, how would you construct this uh, center O here? Well, first of all, it's sort of obviously going to lie on the line that joins the two centers of the circles. That's the first point to observe. And the second point to observe is that if we think about the dilation that takes this circle to this circle with center here, such a dilation takes parallel lines to parallel lines. And we can exploit that by taking any direction, say this direction here, and looking at a point P1 on this circle, which is in that fixed direction from its center, and then going in the same direction from the center of the other circle to a point P2 on its boundary. Right, so these two vectors here are parallel vectors. If we join these two points, P1 and P2 then, we necessarily pass through O. Because when you think about the dilation from O that takes this circle to this circle, say, then it's going to take this point P2 to this point P1. That means that these three points are going to be collinear. Now, um, of course, we could do the same kind of uh, thing with uh, finding O prime, but uh, we have to do things a little bit differently because then we would have to look at uh, a vector in this direction and from here a vector in the opposite direction. Right. So the, the, the dilation that's required centered here that sends this circle to this circle is a similarity which is really multiplying by a negative number. Okay? So the similarity would take this point to this point. So it's a kind of a dilation by, say, negative uh, two-thirds or something like that in this case. And that kind of dilation is still going to preserve the directions of lines, but it's going to negate this direction here. So parallel lines are still sent to parallel lines, but this vector here is going to be sent to a vector like that. Okay, so P1 and P2, these ones here, are called homologous points with respect to this center O. If we continue this uh, line through P1 and P2, say, and find the other point, Q1, that lies on the circle C1, then Q1 and P2 are called anti-homologous points with respect to O. And there are other pairs, for example, this point here and this point here would be anti-homologous pairs with respect to O. And I'll leave it to you to find the anti-homologous pairs with respect to O prime. And so here's a very interesting theorem that the quadrants, and I'm talking about Euclidean quadrants now, between O and Q1 and O and P2 is constant, independent of this position of the red line. It's a lovely uh, property of these two uh, circles and this uh, center of similitude. So I'm going to be explaining to you some, some facts. Okay? We're not going to derive them, although in fact um, probably I'm going to give you the tools that you could uh, investigate these things uh, on your own if you wanted to. But I'm just going to introduce you to this general topic and going to tell you some facts. So I want you just to sit back and enjoy these, these ideas and occasional facts like this one. Okay, time to introduce the important idea of the power of a point with respect to a circle. The power of a point. That's a number associated to a point and with respect to a circle. So to make things a little bit easier in terms of coordinates, let's suppose that our circle is uh, one that's centered at the origin. So it has equation x squared plus y squared equals k. We're in the Euclidean setting here. So here it is right here. And a is some arbitrary point. 
coordinates A and B. All right, then the power of A with respect to C is this number here. We'll call it P of A. It is A squared plus B squared minus K. So A and B are the coordinates of A. So it's, this is the quadrants, A squared plus B squared is the quadrants from the origin to A. And K is the quadrants of this circle. So we could identify this quadrants here. That's A squared plus B squared. And this quadrants from here to here is the number K. What we've drawn here is a tangent from this point A to the circle. Of course, we can only do that if the point A is outside the circle. So let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that it is. So then we draw a tangent to the circle. And we have a look at this triangle, which is going to be a right triangle, because this radius is going to be perpendicular to that tangent. So we have a right triangle, therefore we have Pythagoras' theorem, and we can see that P of A, then, is the tangential quadrants from A to C, because it's the difference between this quadrants here and this quadrants K. So on our diagram, P of A is exactly this quadrants here. That's what this power measures. In other words, P of A is the quadrants between A and D. But another way of thinking about it is just that this circle is defined by this quadratic form, this quadratic function x squared plus y squared. And it's determined by the points where x squared plus y squared actually equals k. Or in other words, where x squared plus y squared minus k equals zero. That's another way of thinking about what the circle is. And so this idea, which goes back to Jacob Steiner, great Swiss geometer of the 19th, early part of the 19th century, he said, let's consider this function x squared plus y squared minus k as actually being a function on the entire plane, not just defining the circle as to where it's zero. Okay. That's another way of thinking about what this power is. It's just extending the quadratic form, suitably shifted, to all the points in the whole plane. All right, so we've made this observation that if A is outside C, then this power is positive. And in fact, it's actually this tangential quadrants. Let's have a look at what happens when the point A is inside the circle, as it is in this diagram. Well, in that case, A squared plus B squared will be less than K. So if we take A squared plus B squared minus K, well, we're going to get something that's negative. Because a squared plus b squared is that quadrants from the center of the circle, which we're still thinking of as the origin, to the point A, while k is the quadrants of the circle itself. So k will be bigger than a squared plus b squared. And if we have a look at this right triangle here, formed by this radius to the point A, and a perpendicular line to the radius through A, meeting the circle at some other point there, then in this right triangle, this side has quadrants a squared plus b squared. This hypotenuse has quadrants k. So k minus a squared plus b squared will be this quadrants here. And that's negative the power. The power is a squared plus b squared minus k. This thing here is k minus a squared plus b squared. So we see that uh, the p of a is the negative of the quadrants from the point a to the circle where we're going perpendicular to the radius uh, from the center to A. Okay, now we have uh, two nice facts. One is that the power of any point A has the following uh, property. If we take any point A and we draw a line through A which meets the circle in two points, say X and Y, then this power of A squared is the product of the quadrants of A to X times the quadrants of A to Y. So this is a classical sort of fact about uh, circles, that if you take a point outside and you take this product times this product, usually of distances it's taught, but it's better to think in terms of quadrants. So this quadrants times this quadrants is independent of the position of that line. 
you move that line around, still through A, and while this point here might get longer, the other uh, quadrants get shorter, and they just compensate exactly so that their product is always constant. And Steiner is observing that the product is, in fact, this uh, power of A squared. If A is outside, well, then that's the uh, tangential uh, quadrants squared. But this also works if A is inside. For example, here, then we're getting that uh, P of A squared would be this quadrants times this quadrants. And that would actually work if we took any line through A, say that one there, then there's a quadrants there and a quadrants there, and you take the product and you're getting P of A all squared. Another very interesting development has to do with the following theorem. That if we have two circles, all right, and um, say C1 and C2, and we're interested in the locus of the point A, which has the property that it's having equal powers to both circles. Right. So we're look, let's say these are the two circles. We're looking for a point A, which has the property that it's power to this circle and its power to this circle are equal. In fact, you can see the point maybe around there is probably not too far away because the power is this quadrants here and the power here is this quadrants here. They're roughly the same. Maybe it should be a bit over like there. So the theorem is that this locus is actually a line. So it'll be a line like this. And that line is called the radical axis of the two circles. It's not hard to see that it's got to be a line perpendicular to the line joining the centers of uh, the two circles. And it's a very important line in, in circle geometry. Okay, so it comes about by thinking about when a point has equal powers with respect to two circles. And it makes sense even if one of the circles is inside the other. There is still a radical axis, but it's maybe a little bit harder to get at. So that's well and good. But we want to now introduce a slight twist on the theory of circles. Uh, historically, people have found that in some situations, it's more convenient to think about circles with orientations. All right. so that's the concept that we want to introduce now, the idea of an oriented circle, which is what we usually think of as a circle pretty well, but with a little bit extra information, namely the information of whether we're going around uh, counterclockwise or clockwise. And our general uh, convention, by the way, is in this direction here, which is the counterclockwise direction, is usually considered the positive orientation for a, a circular motion while this one is considered a, a negative orientation. All right, so how do we get at this idea of oriented circle? Well, we're going to define it this way, which is maybe a little bit unusual. An oriented circle is an expression of the form, a little c, and then uh, the superscript uh, point a, b, and a subscript number r where all these three numbers, A, B, and R, are rational numbers. That's our preferred domain of numbers because we don't really believe in real numbers very much, except in an approximate setting. Okay, so we're defining an oriented circle to be just an expression like this. Of course, we now have to give it some meaning. What does it mean? Well, let's say that the point X, Y lies on this circle precisely when the following equation is satisfied. When x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals r squared. Which you would immediately say, okay, that's just a circle whose center is a, b, and whose radius is r. So that's true. But I, I point out that this r here is allowed to be an arbitrary rational number. It's not necessary for that r to be positive. So it's not entirely correct to say that r is the radius of this circle. r could be positive or r could be negative. This r squared will be the same in both cases. All right. So we're going to say that the oriented circle has positive or negative orientation precisely when r is positive 
or negative. So if this number R here is a positive number, it's a positively oriented circle. And if it's negative, well, then it's a negatively oriented circle. In the case that's uh, sort of in between, if R equals zero, which I like to think of as being both positive and negative, then we'll say that C A B sub zero is a point circle. Let's give an example and we'll illustrate our notation. So here is a circle. It's C at the point minus one one and R equals five quarters. So we're thinking of it visually in terms of the points which lie on the circle. Well, it's going to have center minus one one, which is right here, and it's going to have radius five quarters. That means if we go over five quarters in the, say, positive x direction, we're going to get at a point which lies on the circle. So this is definitely a circle that uh, has points lying on it. In fact, it has uh, points lying on the, the horizontal line that passes through the uh, center. And the fact that this number is positive, we're going to adopt the convention that we're going to give this circle this counterclockwise orientation. We're going to put a little arrow on it that's alerting us to the fact that this is a positively oriented circle. While over here, this expression here, C40 minus 4 fifths, we can see that's going to be a negatively oriented circle. It has center 4, 0. It has radius, what well, we would usually say 4 fifths. But the negative here means that we're going to orient this circle in this direction here. If we change that minus sign to a plus sign, the circle itself, its picture wouldn't change, but that orientation would change from that direction to that direction. And here is the circle C320, which is a point circle because the R is zero. And it's centered at the point 32. That's just what we usually call a point. There's only one point that lies on that circle, namely 32. So the theory of oriented circles is in some ways simpler than the theory of circles. In fact, we're going to see that it has a very direct connection with relativistic geometry. One of the fascinating things that we can do with oriented circles is we can define a nice way, a nice number, that measures how far apart they are in some sense. We're going to call this the quadrants between oriented circles. So here are two oriented circles, circle C and circle D. And they happen to be oriented both positively. And uh, let's say this circle here happens to be the circle A1, B1, R1. In other words, its center is the point A1, B1, and its radius is R1. And because we've oriented it this way, that R1 is a positive number. And D here is center A2, B2 with uh, radius R2. All right, so we saw earlier that when we were talking about circles, there are four possible tangents that are common to both circles. That one there, that one there, that one there, and that one there. When we're working with oriented circles, something a little bit more specialized happens. We can think about this tangent here as also possibly having an orientation. If we're going to give circles orientations, why not give lines orientations too? If we give this tangent line that particular orientation, it's going in that direction, then the orientation of this tangent agrees with the orientation of both of the circles that it's touching. So near this point of tangents here, both the circle and the line are moving in the same direction. They're in accord. Here also at the point of tangency, the circle and the line are in accord. So we could say that this is a common oriented tangent to the two circles. This tangent here would not have that property no matter how you oriented it. If you oriented it this way, then it would agree at this point with this circle, but it would disagree or be in sort of opposite direction with this circle at its point of tangency. Okay. So there's something different that happens about these two lines and these two lines. These two lines are common 
oriented tangents to the two oriented circles. And that has an interesting consequence. That has the consequence that we can measure the separation of those two circles along one of their common oriented tangents. I'm not writing all this down, so, but I'm saying it. In other words, we can think about the quadrants between these two circles to be this number here. The quadrants between these two points of tangency, E and F. And that's going to be the same number as if we take these two points here sort of by symmetry. Now if we stare at this uh, for a little while, okay, we see that we can write an expression for this quadrant's EF. Have a look at uh, these two radii that, that I've drawn. So I've, I've drawn a radii there and a radii there. Those are both perpendicular to the, uh, to the tangents because they're radii coming towards those uh, circles at the tangent points. So if we take a line that's parallel to this tangent through, say, this point here, and that one right there, then this is going to be a nice little rectangle, and this quadrant here is the same as that quadrant here. And now have a look at this little right triangle here. This is going to be a right triangle because this is a rectangle. This quadrant here is just the quadrants between the two centers. It's actually this expression, a squared minus a1 squared plus b2 minus b1 squared. That's the quadrants between the two centers. And what about this quantity here? Well, this has radius r1. This has radius r2. Therefore, this quantity here is r1 minus r2 in this picture. And its quadrants will be r1 minus r2 squared. So this quantity here, what we're calling Q, is a, it's a shorter side, one of the shorter sides of this right triangle. So its quadrants is going to be the hypotenuse quadrants, which is this, minus this little quadrants here, which is R2 minus R1 squared. So in this case here, this expression exactly captures the idea of what the tangential quadrants between these two circles is. All right, so we're going to make this as the definition. Motivated by this, we're going to define the quadrants between these two circles by this formula. And we're going to use that same formula no matter what the radii are. Remember, these radii can be positive or negative. We're going to use the same formula so it's algebraically consistent across all cases. Let's have a look at what happens when the two circles, the same kind of ones, are oriented in opposite ways. So this circle C is oriented in this way as it was before, but this circle is now oriented this way. Well, in this case, uh, the common oriented tangents are these two oriented lines. Alright, so let's have a look at, say, uh, this line here, this common tangent, meeting the two circles at E and F. Here is one radius, R1 is the radius there. Here's another radius, and what's the radius here? Well, the R2 that expresses that number there is going to be negative in this case because this circle is oriented in the negative direction. So the actual usual length that we would talk about is minus R2. All right, now have a look at, we're going to do the same kind of thing we did over here. Uh, we'll take this uh, segment here and draw a parallel one to it uh, through the point D. All right. So that this is now then a little rectangle. All right. And uh, then we're going to consider this side here, which is the quadrants between E and F, same as the quadrants between G and D and G. And we're going to consider also these other two sides of this right triangle. This quadrant here is going to be the same sum of squares of the differences between center coefficients. And now this quantity here, well there's an R1 here, and this quantity here that we're adding will actually be minus R2. So this total here will be R1 minus R2. It's bigger than R1 because R2 will be negative in this case. So this is length is R1 minus R2. And so the quadrants will be R1 minus R2 squared. 
So again, we get exactly the same expression that this quadrant here is this thing, the quadrants between these two points, minus R2 minus R1 squared. So the point is that this is a good definition. It captures the separation between these two circles. It also captures the separation between these two uh, oriented circles. And now let's make a, an observation that if D, say this circle here, happens to be a point circle, if its radius is zero, then this formula is just the power of D with respect to the circle C. If R2 is zero, then we just have an R1 squared here. So we just have the uh, radius R1 of the circle there. A, this thing here and this thing here is just the quadrants between those two points. So we have the quadrants between these two points minus the radius of the circle squared. That's what we called the power of D with respect to C. So what we're doing is we're generalizing or extending this idea of the power of a point with respect to a circle to what we might call the power between two circles, but I just prefer to call the quadrants between two oriented circles. And it's crucial that we have oriented circles. We cannot do this with ordinary circles, because if we had ordinary circles, we would have to have a debate about whether we should use this quadrants or the quadrants along this uh, inner tangent. And there are different quadrants. There's no consistent way of doing it for ordinary circles, but for oriented circles, yes, this is a great definition, defines the quadrants between two oriented circles. And you can perhaps now see where I'm going. All right. In terms of the coordinates a1, b1, r1, and a2, b2, r2, this is essentially just a relativistic quadrants in a three-dimensional space. Exactly the kind of thing that we introduced uh, at the beginning of our lecture. All right, very good. So we've been exposed now to some new circle geometry that will be uh, novel to a lot of you. Um, so there's some interesting opportunities for thinking about uh, things here. This is a subject that was studied quite a lot in the 19th century, mostly due to the impetus of Jacob Steiner. Um, but in the 20th century, it's sort of lied low. But I think what we're going to see now is that it has a natural connection with relativistic uh, geometry. And in fact, gives us a, a way of thinking about relativistic geometry, which is remarkably independent of all those spaceships and things flying around in, in space that Einstein and Minkowski uh, told us about. Very interesting. Okay, so here is a, a challenge that those of you who are geometrically inclined uh, can spend some time thinking about it. It's, it's quite interesting. So if C and D are oriented circles, which are disjoint and not contained one in the other, the kind of situation we were talking about before, you have one circle here, another circle here, then we've just established that the quadrants between C and D, that formula that I wrote down, is in fact the quadrants between them along an oriented common tangent. That's the meaning of Q of C, D. But that expression, Q of C, D, has a value even if the circles don't have those positions, even if the circles are contained one in the other, or perhaps intersecting like this. Okay, so the challenge is to find an interpretation of this uh, quadrants in some of these other cases. In particular, the case where you have one outside circle with some orientation, and then an inside circle with either the same orientation or the opposite one. What does this number measure in this kind of context? Or in this kind of context, where you have one circle and another one intersecting, if the two circles happen to be uh, in the same orientation, then you can talk about a common uh, tangent that's oriented, and you recover the uh, idea that we had before. But if they're in different directions, like this, um, then again, it's a question, what does this number Q of CD actually measure geometrically? 
that's something that you might like to think about. All right, so because of that form of the quadrants between two oriented circles that we derived, where we basically have an x squared plus y squared minus a z squared kind of expression, it's natural for us to try to connect the planar oriented circle geometry with three-dimensional relativistic geometry. And the natural way to do that is to associate to each oriented circle, C, A, B, R, the three-dimensional vector V with coordinates A, B, and R. That's the essential information, just the three coordinates. Top two coordinates are the X and Y coordinates of the center of the circle. The R is the oriented radius, which can be positive, negative, or zero. So we have this then association between oriented circles in the plane, in Euclidean geometry, and these relativistic vectors in V3, or vectors in V3, where the dot product, the relativistic one that we wrote down at the beginning of the lecture, is the main object of interest metrically. So for example, here we have uh, three circles in the plane which are oriented. So this big one here has center uh, minus one, zero. And its uh, radius is uh, one, two, uh, two and a half, let's say, five halves. So there it is there, C minus one, zero, five halves. So to this circle, we can associate the vector over here with coordinates minus one, zero, five halves. Where is that? Okay, minus one in the x direction, zero in the y direction, five halves in the z direction. So uh, one, two, five, so maybe up here. All right, so that'd be, uh, that's V. Let's call it uh, V1, the first one. Of course, we really associating to the vector. It's really a vector emanating there, but we'll just plot the point. Okay, what about this smaller circle here? It has center 2, 1, and it's oriented this way, has oriented radius minus 1. So it's associated to the vector with coordinates 2, 1, minus 1, which is 2 in this direction, 1 in this direction, and minus 1 in the z direction. So we should go down here somewhere. Maybe a little bit further. Maybe down here. Here's V2. And this circle here, well that's a point circle because it has radius 0. The point is 3 minus 1 and so the corresponding vector will be in this xy plane. Okay, our xy plane here is the plane that corresponds to vectors which correspond to actual points in the Euclidean plane. And this one here, 3 minus 1, well we'd have to go uh, 3 and minus 1 I suppose over here somewhere. There it is there. That would be say V3. So basically what we get is that the points in the xy plane over here correspond exactly to the same points really in the Euclidean plane where we're just considering that xy plane is the ordinary Euclidean plane, the ordinary Euclidean structure. But the points lying above those points or below correspond to oriented circles centered at those points. And the higher up you go, the bigger the radii in the positive direction. The further down you go, the bigger the radii in the negative direction. So three-dimensional space corresponding to oriented planar circles. Okay, so that's uh, uh, pretty interesting. Um, now I have an exercise for you, which uh, is to get yourself a dynamic geometry package. Okay, so there's two of them that I recommend, uh, GeoGebra and CAR. They're both free. You can download them free no matter where you are. And they're both lovely programs that allow you to, well, in particular, draw circles, draw homothetic centers, figure out how to draw common tangents. You can measure uh, quadrants between circles and play around with um, 
powers of points with respect to circles and so on. All right, so now that we have this correspondence, we obviously want to explore it a little bit more to say or think about three-dimensional relativistic geometry in the linear algebra setting and how it connects with this very Euclidean planar theory of oriented circles. This is something of a novel point of view. Um, in some sense it goes back to, to Lee. So Lee and other 19th century geometers were thinking in terms of other things other than points um, as being sort of fundamental building blocks for geometry. And there's a theory called Lee sphere geometry of which this is in some sense sort of a kind of a special case. But I think it's fair to say that it hasn't really been developed um, certainly from a 20th century point of view with this linear algebraic uh, orientation too much and it's probably a little bit novel for for physicists. So we're going to investigate it more in our next video. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.